Let's go. <clears throat> Good morning. I hope this is not a Friday thing. Oof. Um, okay, so let's uh, recap what we were doing on one thing. So we said, take a polynomial over the rationals. Um, and the problem, well, if you want to study polynomials over the integers, which is what we're trying to relate here, uh, the problem is that there's denominators. Um, and, and also another problem is that like, if all the coefficients, even if they're integers, if they're all even, um, that kind of messes things up for us. So what you do to solve that problem canonically is to clear denominators, pull out the common, the biggest common factor, and you're left with a number times a polynomial where the coefficients are integers. Well, you know, coefficients are integers. Hello. And they are mutually prime. They're, they, they're, there's no factor common to all of them. And the number that comes out, we call the content. And that polynomial with no common factor, we call primitive. So what we proved on Wednesday, uh, two main things. The first observation is that the content has a denominator, even only if we start with a denominator. So just by, if I tell you the content of a polynomial, you can know if the coefficients are whole numbers. Uh, and the other thing we know, the, the important bit of this whole story, is that when you multiply polynomials, their content uh, gets multiplied. This, I don't know, um, some books call this Gauss's lemma. Some books call Gauss's lemma the thing I'm about to prove. Um, I guess everything, everything I'm talking about is Gauss's lemma. So uh, what is the thing we're gonna do with this? is to show that if you can reduce something over Q, you can reduce it over Z. If it's, uh, of course, if it's, if there's fractions, there's no hope. So say we have a polynomial with integer entries and it factors as a product of two polynomials. Um, we snap rational coefficients. <clears throat> um, so what I'm trying to say, well, say, so that I don't say something silly, See so that the they are not constant. So the degree of both of them is positive. Then we can factor um, f maybe in in some different way. Uh, we're now. the new polynomials, new factors actually have integer entries. So that's what the promise we were making for both of them. If, if I can factor with rational coefficients, I can factor with integer coefficients. Um, and well, the book, so the book says, um, that they have the same degree, the, the new polynomials as the old ones. But I mean, it's not only that, there are scalar multiples of the original ones. So that's what I'm supposed to prove. Um, oof, it's a whole, it's a whole paragraph. <clears throat> so, 
I don't know how to fit this together with the proof. Can I, can I pull this off? Let's see. Um, so as a corollary, before we prove it, if um, f is irreducible over z, it is irreducible over q, which was the the complicated the complicated parts uh, of this equivalence. And irreducible means not a product of polynomials of positive degree. It could be a product of a number by a polynomial, of course. OK, any questions on the statement? Great, so people are just giving themselves Fridays off, I think. All right, so let's prove this. So well, it's clear where I have to start with, uh, I have to start with the supposed parts. Um, <clears throat> so, um, what do I do? Do you find, um, do you say that you find a number G that divides into, or I'll find a number that divides into G1 and G2? I find a, so you're gonna find the number that does what to you want and you two? It divides into that uh, divides into the coefficients. Mm. But the coefficients could be fractions. So what do I mean um, di dividing the coefficients? We apply the previous with the, the content and the form. Sorry, I'm trying to remember what that's called. find okay. the content of, it, of G1 and G2. OK. What were you saying, Sensor? Oh, I don't think my answer is right. Uh, Roy said find the content of G1 and G2. OK. So you're both saying find the content. OK, so. Um, so what do I do with these? What do I do with the contents? Those will be our, uh, the factors of the scalar multiples, right? The fact, uh, uh huh. So, um, say, okay, so say we have an example. If I have the content of G1 is one half and the content of G2 is two thirds. What do I do with this information? <clears throat> oh, I mean, I would substitute it back into the f of x equals uh, g1 of x times g2 of x. Substitute back in. So then you would just put c of g1 times uh, the primitive of each. Ah, so you substitute G1 and G2 by an expression like like this of a number, the constant times a primitive thing. Okay. That's, I like that. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, so we can write 
P1, that's the product of its content times uh, oof, alpha. And, and G2 is the product of its content times alpha 2 of X. <clears throat> so, where alpha one and alpha two are primitive. So there we have some polynomials with, with integer coefficients, which is what we want. So I guess then in this case, F is the product of the content times G one of X, sorry, alpha one, <clears throat> okay, so what about the content of F? What can I say about it? It's equal to the content of G1 times the content of G2. Uh-huh. Who was that, Mason? All right, yeah. Uh, so I think I can say two things, and that's one of the things I wanted to say. One thing is that it's the product of the content. You can express them in lowest terms in both of the contexts in one okay. product. So multiply them together. And what am I supposed to get when I multiply them together? I mean, I'm supposed to get the content of F, but. Um, could, could the content of G1 be one half and the content of G2 be two thirds? So the content of F in this case would be the product of the two numbers I just said, which is one third. Wait, I'm gonna move to slide and rewrite what, what I have. <clears throat> So I'm saying f of x is a product of two polynomials in q of x. I wrote um, g i for each i, it's equal to its content times some primitive alpha i. And the, I know the content of F is the product of these two numbers. So what hypothesis haven't we used yet? Maybe, maybe I'll show you the statement. <clears throat> so it, it says, suppose a polynomial with integer coefficients factors as a product of two polynomials with rational coefficients. Um, and, and then we're trying to see that it factors as a product of two polynomials with integer coefficients. So look at what we've used so far and what we haven't. We haven't used the degree that hasn't come into play yet. Okay. Um, of... So that we haven't really used that, but um, it's not very useful here. I don't. I don't see how we can use. It can be. We can use it. So what else haven't we used? We know that f of x is in uh, the integers, right? Right. We haven't used that the coefficients of f are integers yet. So, uh, what does that say about? Um, about this whole thing. The content of f uh, must be an integer. Right, yeah. Since f of x is, uh, is, is, uh, is in the integer polynomials, its content is also an integer. And And I think that's all we need. So 
So I know, let's see how we organize this. So. <clears throat> we know this is what we, this is the, this comes from factoring and then substituting G's, uh, each of these, and then we said the product of these two contents is the content of F. So now we're saying F is a product of uh, an integer, a polynomial, a primitive polynomial, and another primitive polynomial. And I believe we're done. Um, so you you know you could write you could call this g one tilde if you wanted to, and this g two tilde. Um, then we have that. GI. So when I write I, I mean make I one or two, by the way. So the way we've made it, um, each of these factors is a multiple of the original polynomial because uh, here you have it. This is just some rational number. And F is a product of, of both of them. And, and that's everything we wanted to prove, isn't it? Awesome. Great job. So uh, everyone gets the bonus points. So of course, everyone who is here, which is Roy Santra and Mason. Great job. I didn't do anything. <clears throat> uh, okay, any questions? Okay, so in practice, I mean, in practice, um, well, checking this is a matter of clearing denominators. Um, <clears throat> so, can I give an example? Um, I mean, the, the examples are not very interesting because in every example, you see clearly what is happening. Uh, just let, let's do a very silly example. You take this polynomial, which of course you know how to reduce, but nothing's stopping you from writing it this way. <clears throat> so this is a polynomial with integer coefficients and it factors over Q um, plus. Somewhere there has to be a factorization with integer coefficients, but it's clear how to do it. Just um, pull out the two from the place that has an extra twos and stick that two to cancel out denominators. Uh, yeah, this is, I mean, this is not a practical use of this, of this lemma, but it's just the good thing is that it's guaranteeing that it always works. Every denominator you can pull out is going to cancel out somewhere else. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's move on. So this is um, a great corollary of Gauss's lemma. Um, suppose so. Let's say we have a polynomial uh, 
with integer coefficients, um, say, well, if, if a naught is zero, just divide by x. Um, and if a n is zero, then why are you writing it like this? So uh, what we can say is, is we can tell really easily what rational roots polynomials have. Um, suppose alpha, alpha. Suppose we have a root. Um, and suppose that I wrote it in smallest terms. Then uh, Q, so then the denominator is going to divide the leading coefficient, and the denominator is going to divide the, the constant coefficient. Uh, the bar that means divides, and I'll use this symbol over and over. <clears throat> so, you know, this means that you, if you want to find the rational root of a polynomial, you only need to check probably a very small number of, of rationals, just factor these two numbers. And if they're, for example, if they're one, you only have to check plus minus one, and you're done. So, finding roots if they're rational is just you can just go ahead and test a bunch of numbers, um, which you probably, uh, I think you get told this in high school when you have to, when you have to factor, um, factor polynomials because they tend to always give them to you with in integer roots. So based on this, if a n is one, so if f is monic, then Q will divide um, Q will divide the leading coefficient. So Q will be one. So alpha is an integer and alpha will divide the, the constant term, which is probably the version you see in high school, but this is just as easy if it's harmonic. Okay, um, so let's prove this. So what is the thing we know? What is the thing we know about a polynomial uh, that has a root? It can be divided, it has a linear Sorry. divide. Minus a. Yeah, so linear factor, yeah. Um, x minus alpha is going to have to divide f of x. Um, so I can write f of x as x minus alpha times g of x. Uh, and this is this works over any field, by the way. Remember when, when I prove this, I'm not saying you know this works over the complex numbers. I'm saying this works over whatever field we start with. So g of x has rational entries. Um, so, uh, what can I do now? <clears throat> One thing, well, I could also, I could write this x minus alpha as x minus p divided by q. That's what I said alpha was. And I can write this as a polynomial with integer coefficient. So I have that f of x is qx minus p. So still, this has rational coefficients. Okay, so now I wrote it as as a product. Um, I could use Gauss's lemma, or I could even just uh, take the constant. So, what I want to do is I want to show that, let's say, h of x 
which is going to be this leftover part, has integer coefficients. How can I do that? So I have that F. Uh, H is just the quotient of F by QX minus P. Aren't all the numbers in the, like, isn't it just assumed that they're integers or? Which numbers? The numbers that are um, in H of X, all the coefficients. Well, that's what I'm trying to show. What I know is that every, every coefficient in F and Q and P are integers. And I know Q, Q and P are co-prime. So it's, it's basically what we did before. What, what did we do before when we had F as a product of things and we wanted to show that it, they were, they had integer coefficients? Uh, do you have to take the content of um, both of them? Right, so them? I can take the content. So I have that the content of F is the content of this polynomial times the content of H. So what is the content of QX minus P? Uh, it's uh, one over G, right? Or sorry, G. G. I don't know what G is. Did you, did you say they were co-prime? So is it one? It's one, yeah. I said they were co-prime. The, the way to compute the content, if if they're if they're both uh, if 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 everything is an integer, I don't have denominators to clear. So it's just the GCD of the coefficients. So indeed the content of this polynomial is one. So the content of f is the content of h. Um, and what do I? What is the thing I know about the content of f? So before I ask you what hypothesis we hadn't used for the previous lemma, um, and I'm gonna ask you the same question again, and the answer is gonna be the same. I'm going to, your, your notebook is very loud, so I'm going to mute you until you say something. Um, but anyone, what is, um, I mean, I want to show that H has inter integral coefficients. Um, this is what I want. Um, I, I know that its content is the same as the content of F. Uh, it would be great if the content of H was a whole number. So 
So what is the content of H? Is it a whole number? I mean, it's the same as the content of F. So is the content of F a whole number? Did I give out points too early? So no one wants to talk anymore? The content in total must be a whole number, right? Since both the individual parts are whole numbers. The content has to be a whole number. The content of F or the content of H? The content of F. Is it the content of G? Uh, no. Okay. So, okay, let me answer Roy's question first. Uh, G, G is just H times a number. So, uh, maybe I shouldn't have written G at all anywhere. So whatever, really, I don't care about G anymore. I just care about H um, because it's what appears here. Um, Wait, I'm a bit confused. What's the F of X equals G X minus P? Is that not a G? F of X equals G X. That's, that's the Q. Oh, alpha. Q. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sounds like you fixed it. I don't know where you are looking at. Um, so, okay, so F is, F has content, which is an, an integer because every, everything in there is an integer, I think. Okay. So I'm going to interpret that as every coefficient F has integer coefficients. So it's content is just the GCD of those, which is necessarily an integer. Um, so F is in here, so it's content. So its content is an integer. So the content of H, which is the same number, also has no denominator. And if the content of H is an integer, what we showed on Wednesday is that that means that there, you know, H is a, the product of an, a primitive polynomial with integer coefficients times the content. So H of X is an integer itself. Okay, so what I know is that F is the product of uh, QX minus P times H of X, and this has integer coefficients. So let me copy that again in the next slide. Um, All right, any questions before I turn the page? Yeah, let's turn the page. Uh, so I just rewrote the same thing. If if I have a polynomial with integer coefficients and a root, then I can factor it into qx minus p and a po another polynomial. So what I'm gonna do is just write this out. H is gonna be b0 plus b1x, uh, well, maybe the other way around, right? So I guess the degree, so since the factor has degree one, h is gonna have one less degree. So what happens is that I can write the multiplication out. 
Um, And that's gonna be that's gonna be it. So when I multiply when I multiply these two polynomials, uh, what is the what is the leading coefficient? Q B n minus one. Q B n minus one. And then I go ahead and ignore everything. In between, and what is the constant coefficient? Minus p b zero. Minus p b zero. So these two polynomials are equal. Mean means that uh, every coefficient is the same. And from here, I can tell that a n is q times something, and a naught is uh, negative p times something else. And what does this mean? Well, it was supposed to be blue, wasn't it? Uh, well, it means exactly what I set out to prove. It means that Q must divide a n because all these numbers are integers. And P must divide a naught because negative B naught is an integer. And that's all I asked for. Any questions? Uh, can you explain why we only have to consider the first and last coefficient? Um, we don't. I mean, we, we could be writing the remaining coefficients, but if you look at what I was trying to prove, I was trying to prove something about the first, the, the last and first coefficients anyway. Oh, OK. Sorry. So. I mean, you can, as far as I know, there's there's no nice thing you can say about the others. So, yeah. <clears throat> so the answer is because we got away with it. So they do this right. No. <clears throat> What? Okay, there you go. Um, so, okay, so here's an example of how we can use this. I want to show that this polynomial is reducible. So, I want to say, suppose it reduces and see that it can't. So, let's call this F. So first of all, it's degree three. So if it decomposes into a product of two things, uh, well, the degrees sum uh, to three. Uh, so, and they're positive. So I have two positive integers adding up to three. Um, one must be, one must be one and the other must be zero. 
the other must be two. So, um, so basically, as long as we show that there, there are no degree one factors, we're good. It is enough. So this is irreducible on Q of X. Of course, although we've shown that it's the same. It has no degree one factors. Um, or equivalently, so a degree one factor is the same as having no roots. So if f of a, if f of a rational number is zero, if, if it has a root, then uh, what does the, uh, the last result tell us about the root, about p and q? So if uh, p over q is a root, then uh, q divides the leading coefficient and p divides the final one. Mm -hmm. Since they're both one, there's no p or q that divides them other than one. Or negative or, I mean, one. I mean, or negative yeah. one. Yeah, so q divides the leading coefficient. Exactly, exactly what you said. Uh, p divides the constant coefficient, so p divided by q is plus minus one. So all I need to do is compute f of one, which is, I believe, negative five, which is not zero, f of negative one, uh, which I hope is not zero, uh, negative one minus three, negative four, plus four, this is one, which is not zero, uh, so we're done. So this polynomial is irreducible. <clears throat> uh, because of course, this is this is having degree three or two means you only need to check for no roots, uh, which certainly makes life easier. Any questions? Okay. This stuff, however, it, it's still powerful even even for for polynomials of higher degree. So let's do this example is out of the book. Um, I want to show that this polynomial of degree four is irreducible. So um, so what I need to do first um, is think of the degrees of the, the factors. So they have to add up to four. So it could be one plus three or two plus two. Um, if it's one plus three, uh, that means that there's a root just like before. And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna do it. I have five minutes left. But just like before, the, the, the polynomial is monic, so the rational roots have to be integers and the constant coefficient is one. So all you need to check is that one and negative one are not roots. And in this case, um, in this case, every, if you plug in one or negative one, you get an even, an, an odd number. So if you're not gonna get zero. So how to see if, if factors as a quadratic times a quadratic. Uh, so 
the thing you can just do, is, um, and you know, sometimes you'll be luckier than others, is just write out some equations. So if it factors, it means I can write it in this way. So the important thing here is that by Gauss's lemma, everything here are integers. And that, I mean, I have, I'm gonna, if I expand this, I'm gonna have a lot of equations in six variables. Um, but the fact that they're integers uh, makes life a lot easier. Um, for example, P times Q is the leading coefficient, which is one. So I can I can assume P and Q are one. I can assume they're both monic. That's true in general. If you have a monic polynomial with integer coefficients and it factors, it's going to factor as a product of monic polynomials with integer coefficients, as you're as you're seeing here. Any questions? Okay, so this is the equation I have to solve and I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna go multiply it and, and solve it. So this is x to the fourth, x cubed has coefficient a plus c, x squared has coefficient b plus c, x has coefficient a, d plus b, c, and the constant term is b, d. So, Based on this equality, this is negative two, this is one, sorry, this is zero. This is one, and this is one. So, <clears throat> um, so given that they're all integers, it's very easy to see that these have no solutions. Uh, I think um, based on the fact that b times z is one, well, they're integers. So what could they be? Yeah, b one and negative one. Right. Either either they're both one or they're both negative one. Um, but also based on the second equation, the second coefficient, b plus z is zero. So we can't have um, uh, neither of these are solutions. Oh no 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 no! I I multiplied it wrong. I'll get them right out of time. This is not b plus d. This is b plus d plus a c. Okay, either way, B plus D. Ooh, am I not trying to do this properly? Um, right. So they're both one or negative one. So either way, they're both equal. So from the fact that one is AD plus BC, I have that, well, D is B. So this is really A plus C times B. But also A plus C is negative two. So this is, equation 
equation three, equation two, equation one, equation zero. So from equation zero, the product of D and D is one. So they're both equal and they're both plus or minus one. So in equation one, I have that a plus c times b is one. But equation three tells me that a plus c is negative two. So putting these two together, negative two b is one, which means that b has to be negative one half, which is uh, doesn't work because I know they have to be an integer. And I'm done. So, you know, this is not something, I don't know, it's just, it's not pleasant to take a degree four polynomial and try to write out coefficients and see what happens. But since Gauss's lemma in this case tells us that the coefficients are guaranteed to be integers, um, it becomes something that's a doable thing. <clears throat> I, I kind of run out of time, but I think if you go through it, you can figure it out pretty easily. All right, uh, that's all I got. Um, I'll stick around if you have questions, but 